this list in our number 10 spot, we have courtly love. We've discussed a lot on these lists how medieval marriages were mostly about the transferring of wealth and land, and really didn't have much, if anything, to do with love. This would be obviously a less than ideal way of living, so to make things a little more bearable, there was the practice of courtly love. This of course was for members of the court, and it allowed lords and ladies to experience love despite their marital status. This was actually a huge hit, and so many people became involved that there ended up being a list of rules posted, and one of which included the rule, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. That's not really a rule, I guess that's more of just a saying. <laughs> The courtly love saw people doing things such as dancing and giggling, and if they really wanted to get a little risque, they'd even hold hands. Sex, of course, was forbidden, however, because there are some boundaries while being married. It's just sad that people were in these loveless marriages and had to resort to things like this, all because they simply weren't allowed to marry for love. I am glad, though, that they were able to have some kind of freedom. In our number nine spot today, we have funeral shrouds. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far because it really helps us out. In part one of this video, we talked about how women who were in a lower income family often were unable to purchase any sort of garment that would be specifically used for their wedding due to the fact that it was just unreasonable for them to be able to purchase an item that would only be used once. This didn't only extend to dresses but also to veils which many women already owned. What I want to add on to that thought for today's video however is that those veils were often also used in another large life event and that would be their funeral. It's quite sad to think of the garment being shared on these two separate occasions. Nowadays, we would think of a wedding as one of the happiest moments and celebrations of a person's life, but in the medieval times, marriage was often only slightly better than one's funeral. In our number eight spot today, we have the Holy Sacrament. Marriage ceremonies have come a long way from what they used to be like, and actually a lot of people in the medieval times didn't even have a ceremony at all. Couples didn't need permission to marry before like we do now. All that was required for a marriage to be binding was that both parties parties uttered consent to the marriage, and this could be done in their bed, in the pub, in the middle of the street, it really didn't matter. But this is the practice that led to marriage becoming what it is today. Because officials were unable to prove if people were actually married, whatever that means, of course they got the church involved in the process. This is the reason why marriage began to be declared as a holy sacrament that needed to be observed by God. In our number seven spot today, we have extracurricular activity. The church certainly had a view of marriage that was to control sexual activity. Any of this sort of intimacy outside of marriage was completely unacceptable and considered sinful, and sex within marriage was only meant to be for the purpose of procreation. In fact, many people believed that if these activities took place in a marriage outside of procreation, that that it would be a bad thing. St. Jerome stated in the 4th century that a man who is too passionately in love with his wife is an adulterer, and this was a sentiment taken seriously by the people of the church in these times. These were the rules surrounding who was allowed to participate, but there were also rules surrounding the activity itself, and one of those rules was that it was forbidden when a woman was unclean. What would be unclean, you ask? Well, of course, when a woman was menstruating or pregnant or breastfeeding or for 40 days after childbirth, these sorts of rules and views are thankfully outdated as they make literally no sense at all, but their existence surely has proven harmful to even our modern views. In our number six spot today, we have the court of incompetence. We talked about how hard it could be to get a divorce in the medieval times and how it was nearly impossible unless you died or disappeared, but today we will talk about one of the ways you could potentially get a divorce, and that is in the court of incompetence. This is exactly what it sounds like as women could apply for an annulment of their marriage if it turned out that their husband was incompetent. And yes, they really did have a way to test this. The test would be done by witness testimony, which explains itself, and I won't go into a lot of detail about that. Although kind of embarrassing and degrading, this might make the medieval times seem a little bit more progressive than they actually were, but do not be fooled. This was just to ensure that babies continue to be born and money continue to be shared. It certainly wasn't about anybody's happiness or anything absurd like that. In our number five spot today, we have the patriarchy. In the medieval times, it is no shocker to us that men were considered the heads of the household. The men played a role and they were expected to love and honor their wives, 
but also to govern them. Women were expected to show their love by obeying their husbands. The women were considered to be peacemakers and were to ensure that their marriage stayed as peaceful as possible by fully submitting to their husband. This was mostly the worst for the marriages of nobles, as lower class marriages tended to be a bit more casual, but all marriages in these times were expected to have this kind of power dynamic. So basically, as a woman, you couldn't marry who you love or do anything that you wanted to. In our number four spot today, we have the landlord fee. In the medieval times, if you were someone who was renting land from another person, you could be subject to a fee upon getting married. But this fee would be paid to the landlord who has absolutely nothing to do with the marriage. I couldn't imagine getting married and being forced to pay my landlord money because of it. Like my rent isn't already high enough. This fee was only implemented if the bride had a dowry, but it just seems extremely bizarre. Maybe there was a perfectly reasonable explanation for this, but it truthfully seems a lot more like some sort of cash grab. In our number three spot today, we have lying to the courts. I spoke previously about how you used to be able to get married by just saying a few words, but of course there for some reason needed to be proof of marriage, and thus the push for the observation of God began. During this time, people began trying to enforce the disputed marriages, and many people were facing the courts in an attempt to prove their marriage was not just a sham. They would go into court and declare their love for each other, but there of course were people who took advantage of this. Some people who no longer wanted to be in the marriage would take advantage of this moment by never claiming any sort of love or affection to their supposed partner, others would make up stories about the two being betrothed to each other in order to get a sentence of a wedding celebration. Sometimes it would turn out that one of the partners was actually already married and had just pretended in order to entice the other one into a night in bed, and sometimes if a woman had become pregnant, she would claim to have been married to the man who fathered the child. It truthfully was all quite messed up and very confusing, and it really was a game of he said, she said. And in number two spot today, we have double consent Consanguinity. Double consanguinity is the case that comes up when there is consanguinity from two sources. In the medieval times, it was common for two siblings in one royal family to marry two other siblings from another royal family. The children of these couples would be considered double first cousins. They would be allowed to marry as first cousins, but they technically had an even closer biological relationship than regular first cousins did. This might be a little strange to a lot of us now, based on most of our ways and lives and the law, but these rules were formed before the concept of genetic relationships and DNA was even known, so there of course would be seemingly nothing wrong with it in these times. In our number one spot today, we have coercion. This one is quite dark, you guys, and it might be triggering to some people, so I just want you to proceed with caution on this one. Many researchers and historians have noted how many women in the medieval times who were kidnapped or sexually ended up marrying the men who did these things to them. Unfortunately, women didn't have a lot of resources, legal or otherwise, to escape the pressure put on them by these violent men, and were more so coerced into marriage than actually consenting individuals. It is also believed that many of the survivors of the more violent attacks ended up in the marriage because of the damage the attack did to their reputation, which is so incredibly heartbreaking. There's actually a record that we have of a spontaneous marriage after an abduction. We only have a few sentences that judge spoke, but he enforced the marriage of Michael Betton and Katerina Binken, sentencing them to celebrate it properly. The records we have show how he abducted Katerina violently and against her will, but then she just spontaneously decided to marry him afterwards. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have betrothal. Betrothal was a popular precursor to medieval marriages as it was a promise to be married, sort of like an engagement. In these times, however, betrothal was often just as legally binding as marriages, even though it was quite common for betrothed couples to never even get a chance to meet until their wedding day. This was all because of the fact that marriage had truly nothing to do with love, and the most important reason for it was was the acquisition of wealth. The worst part of the betrothals, however, is that they could be arranged at the age of reason. The age of reason should be a reasonable age, but of course it is not, as a betrothal could be arranged at just seven years old. The redeeming part about this gross and weird rule is that the betrothal would not be legally binding until they became of age, but it's still pretty messed up when you really think about it. Coming in at number nine, we have the marital combat. In medieval Europe, if a husband and wife got into a dispute, they would settle it by fighting, one-on-one -on -one medieval combat style. 
They both had to wear a special attire while doing so. This was a tight-fitted bodysuit with a hood. The wife would also carry a cloth, and inside was a couple of stones that weighed four or five pounds. So whoever won the fight would win the argument, as long as the other person didn't end up dead. This was particularly popular in Germany, and they had more rules than other places. For example, the husband had to stand in a hole waist deep with a hand behind his back, while his wife ran around him with that sack filled with rocks. The man had three wooden clubs with him. He could not leave his hole. If he touched the edge of the pit with his hand or arm, then he would have to give up one club to the judges. If the woman hit him with a rock while she was running around him, then she would have to give up one of her stones. I don't know how this solved anything, but they thought it was a good method back then. In our number eight spot today, we have divorce. Divorce wasn't necessarily a popular thing in the medieval times, which seems weird considering how little choice most people had in their marriage partners. Divorce was much less common back then for the simple fact that there were only a few reasons that were considered good enough for divorce. These were, if either in the couple were not of legal age, which is a pretty good rule to have, and the other reason being if the husband or wife had previously made a religious vow or were not Christian, then the marriage could be dissolved. While well, it's good that there were a couple reasons, these being the only reasons certainly didn't leave the people who were forced into these marriages with a lot of options. In our seventh spot, we have divorce by death. Now I know Olivia just finished talking about how hard it was for people to get divorced. And she's right, it was. But in some places, there is one way you could easily get a divorce. And that's if your spouse died. So let's say there's some dispute between the two. We all know that you duel it out. But here's the thing. If the woman won the duel, then the man was executed. If the man won the duel, then the woman was buried alive. Doesn't that sound extreme? So it's either you kill or be killed. No thanks. I'm glad that this is not a thing anymore. In our number six spot today, we have wards of the king. In the medieval times, since people were seen less as people and more as what they can provide, orphans who were wealthy, female heiresses, and wealthy widows all became wards of the king. That is dark in itself, but since marriage is all about money, the king used these people to his advantage. These women could be married off to the men of the court who wanted to increase their wealth and land, or a lord would also be able to sell her marriage to the highest bidder in order to make up for the loss of income she would have provided. If one of these women went and married someone on their own accord, she would then lose the money that was rightfully hers. How absolutely backwards is that? We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the arranged marriages. Back in the day, women did not have a choice as to who they were going to marry. In fact, most of the time, they didn't even know the man before they got married to him. Men, on the other hand, were so sometimes allowed to choose their bride, and the women had no say. If they got chosen, then they were forced to wed. But back in the day, most marriages were political arrangements and not based on true love. This was typically set up by the bride and the groom's parents, and the women were often really young girls. The whole basis of the marriage was set upon how much the girl was worth. Every man wanted a girl that came from a wealthy family. In our number four spot today, we have the wedding wardrobe. Of course, royals and high-class people in these times would spend a fortune on their wedding outfits, which is truly not unlike our world today. The garments would usually be embellished with jewels and they would have extravagant crowns, but this wasn't the case for everyone. People who were lower class in these times would often be unable to have any kind of wedding attire at all. It would be insanity to purchase a garment for one occasion, and instead they would have to choose from the best and cleanest garment they owned. Rather than crowns and tiaras, women would wear a veil since it was common at the time for women to wear them in their everyday lives, so again it would be something they already owned. If a woman didn't have one, however, it was customary for them to wear a crown made of flowers over their loose hair. While this to them would be a symbol of their status in life, I think that they must have looked quite beautiful. In our third spot, we have the marriage restrictions. So I know I talked about how a man could choose who he wanted to marry, but there were a couple of rules when it comes to that. For example, there were a number of reasons as to why a marriage could be prohibited. One of them being if the girl was related to him. Thank the Lord for that one. The other one is if the boy or girl had taken a religious vow. Now here's where it gets wacky, okay? Adultery and in were reasons a marriage could be prohibited, but they were not grounds for a divorce. That is severely messed up. Also, fun fact, you couldn't be married by someone who was a killer. 
which I mean, why would you want to anyways? In our number two spot today, we have purity. Of course, women have been subject to this weird standard of purity for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was so bad in the medieval times, however, that it was very common for women to have to take a type of purity test in order to assure her new husband. We won't get into the multitude of reasons why that is both horrible and extremely bizarre, as we would be here all day, but I will talk about the test they felt necessary to do. For royals, the wedding night was usually watched by observers, which is super weird, but in an even weirder turn of events, after the marriage was consummated, it was normal for the sheets to be checked after for blood. For people who were lower class, they usually didn't have observers, but there was apparently a rule for these couples that would allow the local ruler to have sex with the bride on her wedding night before the groom. But this is debated by some historians, and I just truly hope that that it is untrue. And in our number one spot, we have domestic violence. Sadly, back in the day, domestic violence was typical in households. Even if a husband was abusive towards his wife, it was hard for her to leave him and get a divorce. In fact, if a woman defied her husband's authority, then he could punish her for it, and the wife would have to accept this punishment with no complaints. In fact, the system was so messed up back then that if a woman killed her husband, let's say he was getting violent and physical with her, and she defended herself, and he ended up passing away, well, she would be found guilty of treason and abrogation of authority. That is totally insane and highly messed up. Coming in at number 10, we have Anna Baker's wedding dress. Old mansions tend to have ghost stories affixed to them, but I have to say this ghost story is a little bit out of the ordinary. While the house itself is rumored to be haunted, the main topic of conversation when it comes to paranormal activity here is a haunted dress, a wedding dress. Now this is kept in the mansion termed museum and people can still visit it today. The Baker the mansion is a historic home dating back to 1844 and was the home to wealthy iron master Elias Baker. Elias and his wife had four children, but one of them died of diphtheria. Their only surviving daughter, Anna, was a spinster and lived at the house until her death in 1914. It is not that she lived without love, however, just the love that she had was forbidden by her father. It seems that Anna fell in love with a local iron worker, but her father considered him to be lowborn and not good enough for his daughter. Anna even bought a wedding dress to try and convince her father that she was serious, but he still forbade the union and the dress went unworn, by Anna at least. Some years later, when her love had moved on, another woman wore the dress. Wearing Anna's intended wedding dress, Elizabeth Bell was said to have mocked Anna for having never taken a husband. Anna died an old woman in the mansion left to her by her family in Pennsylvania. It seems that her spirit never left though, it haunts the wedding dress that remains on the property and now makes up part of the museum. The dress used to be kept by behind glass and was often reported to move of its own accord, one day falling heavily against the glass during a thunderstorm. Others said when they looked into the glass at the dress, they would catch the reflection of a woman staring back at them. Some say the dress moves because of the old floorboards in the display cabinet being weak and subject to kind of moving around a bit. Others swear that they feel her presence when they look at her dress. Who knows? Coming into number nine, we have the exploding wedding gift. In February 2018, tragedy struck an Indian couple who had just celebrated their wedding in Odisha, India. The pair had returned home with their wedding gifts after several days of celebration. I actually went to an Indian wedding earlier this year and I experienced firsthand what a great big party it all is. Several days, loads of food, drink, dancing, merriment. It truly is a happy occasion and a big deal. Sadly, when the newlyweds got home and were opening their presents among their their family, one of the gifts they had received at the reception exploded, killing the groom and severely injuring the bride. Sadly, also the groom's grandmother died in the blast. Following on from the incident, police were trying to identify who had gifted the couple the package and what their motivation was. Right now, they are still being sought for murder and I really hope that this case gets solved. Coming into number eight, we have a bride's bouquet crashing a plane. Weddings are a bit ridiculous sometimes. In my opinion, weddings are supposed to be about two people who love each other, making a commitment to love each other forever. Some people wanna do this in low-key ceremonies, others wanna do this in big, huge, costly ceremonies. Sometimes wanting to throw an impressive party and upstaging other couples is more of a focus than the love part. In 2009, a couple wanted to make a big deal of the bouquet toss, a tradition in many Western weddings. Basically, they pulled out all of the stops and hired a plane to fly over a line of women standing below. Sadly, when the flowers were thrown out of the plane, they were sucked straight on back into 
the engine, causing it to catch fire and explode. The plane crashed in a field in front of onlookers. Luckily, neither of the two people in the plane died, but the bride was seriously injured, suffering facial and cranial trauma. Even worse, at number seven, we have another crash, and this time it was deadly. A tragic video recorded by the wedding photographer captured the moment a bride died on the way to her wedding in a helicopter. Brazilian bride Rosemary do Nascimento Silva chose to arrive at her wedding in a helicopter as a surprise for her fiance. Sadly, as he waited at the altar, the helicopter carrying the bride, her brother, the pregnant photographer, and the pilot crashed, killing all on board. Now, the footage is totally heartbreaking. We see how beautiful and happy and excited the bride looks as she's on her way to the ceremony. Sadly, then the footage turns nightmarish as an alarm can be heard going off. Footage starts to shake and the passengers scream. The groom was told about his bride's death at the altar. How devastating. Coming into number six, we have the rather creepy tradition of Chinese ghost weddings. Usually, I absolutely love East Asian countries because to me, as a Westerner, some of their traditions can be a little quirky and I like that. This tradition, however, is both quirky and scary and not necessarily in a good way. In some Chinese cultures, they believe that if a man dies without getting married, then his soul will haunt his living relatives for the rest of their lives, causing bad luck as he does so. What to do about this then? Obvious, right? Get him married. But wait, he's dead. No problemo, get him a ghost wedding. A ghost wedding is a ceremony where a man's corpse is married off. Luckily, not to a living lady, but a dead lady. Creepy. The families still have the whole party and everything, and they have a little paper bride and groom at the top table feast. While this seems like it would be an all right deal, kill two already dead birds with one stone, it does pose a whole load of ethical questions and encourages grave robbing. That's right, the dead male needs a dead lady to marry and bodies sell for a lot of money on the black market. Understandably, people are upset when the remains of their family loved ones are stolen away and buried next to some dude they'd never knew in real life. It gets worse too. With a shortage of graves to rob, some people have even turned to murder. In 2016, a man was arrested in Northwest China for killing two women with mental disabilities and selling their bodies as corpse brides. Coming into number five, we have this Sirigam marriage hall fire. So this is actually so, so sad. Back in January 2004, fire tore through a makeshift wedding hall in southern India. The fire occurred in the famous temple town of Sirangam, and the reception hall was a makeshift pavilion with a thatched roof on the terrace of a one-story building. It is thought that this celebrations were underway. A fire started as a result of an electrical short circuit from fairy lights catching fire. Sadly, the blaze spread very, very quickly, burning the guests alive. Others who died were crushed in a stampede as they tried to escape the flames. 45 people in total were killed, including the groom. The bride was seriously injured. This story is an old East Texan piece of folklore at number four. We have something like a mashup scene between Game of Thrones and Peaky Blinders. We have the story of the poisoned cake. In May 1847, the Texas Telegraph and Register of Houston reported this in San Augustine, 70 of 80 people attending a wedding on the evening of the 22nd of April were taken ill and 10 died from the effects of poison. It actually turns out that from examining an old letter from a local doctor anyway, it seems that 17 people died and a further 15 were dangerously ill. So what happened? The bride was an orphan raised by a dubious man called Mr. Wilkinson. Her choice of husband was also said to be from the rough side of the tracks. Despite the bad characters involved, the local community were keen for a party. An old man Wilkinson even invited his previous foes, although one family, the Sanders family, declined the invitation. For some reason or another, Manic Wilkinson tampered with the cakes for the wedding. Unbeknownst to the Sanders family, he sent them slices of the wedding cake as what looked like a gesture of goodwill. Little did they know they were laced with arsenic. So too was the wedding cake served at the actual wedding ceremony itself. Everyone but the Wilkinsons tucked into the food. They all, including the bride, survived, but unfortunately the same couldn't be said for a number of the other guests. It seems that the whole wedding was a ruse by old man Wilkinson to bump off his enemies. Three members of the Sanders family died after eating the packaged up cake, as did 17 wedding guests. The wedding turned into a scene from the Red Wedding as guests started dying in the reception hall, groaning and vomiting in a way more dramatic way than King Joffrey's death at the Purple Wedding. It wasn't a perfect crime though. Wilkinson had hoped that the deaths could be shrugged off as simple food poisoning, but when his family remained untouched by illness, local authorities were deeply suspicious. He was brought before a magistrate, but managed to escape on a horse. The events that transpired 161 years ago still remain one of the worst cases of mass murder in East Texas. 
Cutting into number three, we have the Brazilian Groom Rampage. In December 2010, a groom in Brazil went ballistic, opening fire at his reception of 200 guests. So, what happened to turn what was supposed to be the happiest day of this man's life into a bloodbath in which his wife and best man were killed? It seems that Rogero Damasenka and Retina Alexandra Costa Collas' wedding was off to a normal start. The pair exchanged vows, smiled for pictures, and ate at their wedding reception. As late night speeches were being delivered, the groom said he had a surprise for his wife. He then produced a .38 caliber pistol and shot her, then his best man. He shot them several times, making sure that they were dead, then he turned the gun on himself, shooting himself through the head. All three of them died and a further guest was injured as a bullet grazed them. The massacre took place at 2am in front of 200 guests. After the murder-suicide, it was revealed that the groom suspected his wife had been having an affair with his best man. How awful. Coming into number two, we have the Kampala wedding massacre. What happened at a wedding in Kampala, Uganda that left 27 people dead? Irene 80 was attending her friend's wedding when a male guest, Richard Komaketch, a private in the Ugandan military, asked her to dance. She didn't fancy it, declining his offer. He then started getting pretty persistent and she declined him again. Now this is when he got aggressive. He started being very raucous and as a result he was thrown out of the party. This didn't sit well with him. He went home, got a semi-automatic rifle and returned. He killed Irene first, then over open fire randomly at guests. 14 people died on the spot and 12 more in hospital. Komiketch tried to kill himself but failed, pretending to be dead. Then, when police arrived, he basically still pretended to be dead. In an even more dramatic turn of events, Irene's father realized he was still alive, broke through the police cordon and killed Komiketch by smashing in his skull. Oh my goodness. Finally, coming into number one, we have a serious and persistent issue, the scariest wedding stories of them all that that happen all over the world each year, we have the story of child brides. There really is no scarier wedding story than that of child brides. It's happened throughout history and it is still happening today. Girls as young as 11 are being married off to men often several decades older than them. Some of the youngest child brides have still been toddlers. It's totally abhorrent. Niger is the worst country for child brides with 76% of children married before they're 18 and 28% married before 15. Regionally in differ, 89% of girls marry as children. Other offenders at the top of the child marriage rate list are the Central African Republic, Chad, Bangladesh, India, Mali, South Sudan, Guinea, Mozambique, Somalia, and Brazil. It isn't even developing nations either. In the UK, up to 8,000 people are at risk of being forced into young marriage. Between 2000 and 2010, over a quarter of a million children in the United States have been married, mainly to adult men. 25 states to the USA don't even have a minimum marriage age law. I read Nora Al Shams account of her own marriage when she was 11 to a man in his 30s. Now, the marriage took place in Yemen. She recalls her initial delight at the three-day event being allowed to wear three beautiful dresses. However, she recalled her fear when the celebrations were over and she was left alone with her husband. She said he was three times my age and saw marriage as a means to act like a depraved animal. After she slept with her husband for the first time, she was rushed to hospital. She said, I was a child being treated as a sex object, but the abuse did not stop. Nobody was interested in my complaints, as I was legally a wife. How absolutely repugnant and horrifying is that? Child marriage is a real-life horror story being forced on millions of young girls worldwide, and it absolutely needs to be stopped. Mm -hmm.